Good thing you asked. <laughs> Right, so coming back to here, um, selecting columns in your data frame. So in this data I have from HDB has three columns, financial year, number of applications, uh, and application type. So if you, want to, if you want to retrieve the two or the columns, you can just pull out based on the name, but you have to do, uh, call it, use a square bracket rotation, then followed by the name of the column each, uh, separate by the comma. So in this case, if it's not a very big data, so you get everything yeah, here. So you can also do some um, selection of filtering. Okay, so, so the selection filtering here is actually the same as your Boolean indexing. So if you recall Boolean indexing when you're handling your NumPy and dimension array. Okay. So financial year, if I want to give me all the um, 2008 values, it's this. So whatever you supply here, this is actually generating a Boolean index being applied to your data frame. So you can recall if you do your NumPy, typical NumPy operations like your subsetting, slicing, data frame, uh, filtering, right? It will still work in pandas. Okay. So that's sort of like pandas out of the box. It's like a regular n-dimensional array. You can work with it that way. Okay, now in pandas, um, just like now, how you can save the data. So saving data is also is also a little bit uh, much easier in terms of syntax. So if you're reading, it say read CSV. So you want to save, uh, of course, it doesn't say to CSV, uh, save CSV, but says to CSV. So if I want to extract a subset of data and just save it, okay. So in this case, I decided to just pull all the 2008 um, applications for financing, okay. So it's td dot to csv. Uh, of course, I need to wait. I need to not pd. Sorry, d. Ew. csv about two eight. Okay, uh, nothing happened because it's saving. Go to data. Oh, not data. I save it down here. Okay. So when you do a save, um, it no so saves your index. So this is how reading and saving TSC, uh, saving your files generally work. Uh, in a slight example, they actually save as a tab delimiter file. Do they? No. CSV file. Let me see. CSV separator. Okay, I just want to find out whether I can save as a TSV file or not. Oh, yes, you can. Ah. If I don't want the index, I can still do something about it. Okay, maybe I try this. Huh? So I save this index for. I don't want the index. Can you do that? Oh, no. Self half. Okay, let me see, look for my file. Okay, no more index. So if you want to save your file, let's say you use pandas, read the file, and you want to save it, and you don't want the index to appear in your save file, okay, for some reasons, you can provide a parameter called index force, and your index will disappear. So if you do read out the pandas documentation, there's a lot of options here. Uh, so you can add in all this, you can choose all these options to decide how your file output should be like um, from even separators. You can make it a TSV output if you want to, so it can, be, it can be obtained. But as long as you read out the documentation there, you can see. Okay. 
Okay, so that's reading and saving a file. Um, so here are some examples uh, from reading different sources. So you know generally people work with Excel files. Um, Microsoft, the latest of Office, so XLSX extension files. So you can also read normal typical Excel files. Uh, since you get the data in Excel, you don't want to, from Excel, from the CSV, you can read, call the read Excel function in pandas. Okay. Of course, you must specify the sheet that you're reading from, because Excel does come in the work in the multi sheet format. You can also read from HTML tables. Um, so if you know HTML tables, okay, never mind. Then uh, so if someone has data that they actually like just put into a HTML table that looks like this, okay. So how do you pull this data out from a web page? Well, in a way, you can use um, the, the read HTML function from pandas. Um, but I really haven't tried it yet, because when you read HTML from a page, um, you need to look for some kind of table structure to deal with. So notice at the end, there's an indexing. So when you read from a page, I think this chance that this read HTML will give you might give you multiple tables in the from the structure of the data, the code. Okay. Um, it's a hit and miss now when doing this because some on the web page if they code everything with tables, then you're kind of screwed. Okay. So you can take a look at the different um, methods here. Now to save data, we try we show you the to CSV format just now. You can also save it back as an Excel file. So if you got data in as Excel and you need to pass it back to a colleague in Excel format, then you can do a to Excel instead. Okay. Um, to JSON as well, if you are let's say handing data to some kind of a web service, you can do a to JSON. Right. So I'll go really fast here. <clears throat> okay. So just now, with just some of the little functions, setting, uh, filtering, it's all similar to how NumPy does it and dimension arrays. But we want to look at what the can data frames really offer because data frames are not just an uh, n-dimensional array, but they can do a lot more. So in pandas, they you need to focus on three type of structures. One is called a series, which is a single, it's literally like a list. Data frame will be your two-dimensional data and your panels. So in series, to create a series or one-dimensional label array, all you need to do is call from the PD the method called series and pass in the data and then followed by specifying the index. Okay. Now your data here uh, can be a dictionary, n dimensional array, or just a single value. When you, say, when you see scalar, it actually means just one singular value. The index basically are uh, labels. Um, so later I'll show you in the code what it actually means. So if I were to create a simple series like this, okay. So when you call series, you just pass in a list, an array of numbers and values, and you want to print it out, you will get something like that. Now, first thing you notice is on the left hand side, immediately there's this index created again. Okay. So when doing pandas, they always have a sort of index generated by default, right? So I didn't specify what kind of index I want. But if I don't want this index, I could say, you know, put index table. So there's a, actually there is a option to put an index. So maybe my index is, okay, not the greatest index you can find. I think so. Yeah. So an index basically is telling pandas, I don't want your zero to what, I just give you my custom index. Okay. Now, now you look at this data, suddenly it looks a little bit like a dictionary. So you can have text as an index referring to a value in the list. So this is also a variation on the index. Okay. So in terms of data here, uh, you can even have read, maybe you have a, NumPy and dimensional array, you can also put it in, it still works. 
Now the integer type when you print out S, which is your series, it has a D type integer 64. So that's default uh, given to if it sees like the I think the generally the logic is if it sees a number, it gives it the, the number integer 64 D type. If this were all text like that, so let's say I just change all this to text. Then you get a D type of object. And if you want to specify your D type, you I think you should be able to do this too. Yeah. However, U2 I think is still string object okay other forms of data that you can send into series in this case is a dictionary okay so actually what I did just now was I created a list specific index and immediately my index actually appeared on the left hand side right as some kind of as some kind of a key value if you give it a dictionary then you get the same effect So some more additional values, uh, some more examples like using NumPy to generate random numbers and putting a series, okay, and using letters A to E as a sort of index. Okay, so what if you we only give it one value but have an index that runs uh, an index of a certain size that's not one value. So for pandas to make sense of a scalar value with an index that has more than one value, more, more than one uh, for its length, then you just repeat the one value across all the different indexes you provide. Hmm? Oh, the other way. Huh? So I have a, a list here, right? Then my index is shorter than the list. <laughs> Okay, error because uh, precedence on the data first, then index. Even if your index is three elements and your this is the value is three element, index is four, it's still you still have a problem. It's supposed to match. The single value it just repeats the single value. Okay, so that's all for series. Um, is there anything else you can do in series? Yes, you can. Okay, so given this is my series here, one, two, three, four, um, one, two, three, four, right? What happens if I do this? S and then square bracket one. What do you think will happen? What do you think I will get? Try la. <laughs> you got to be talking the top. Try now. Try now. Try now. Try now. Okay. Okay. So when you're treating S as S is a series, right, from pandas, but however, it's also like a it's like it's also like a list. So like a typical list, this thing here has an invisible index starting from zero, one, two, three, right. So if you say one, it be this element. 0 will be the first first value, which is 1. What about this index here? Since I already specified some kind of uh, index using strings, what can I use that? Let's try. So it works too. Maybe a little bit confusing, since you can call it two ways. Okay, so your series is like a list, means all your typical lists are subsetting, slicing, should work. Means if I want to give, if I want to get myself the first three values here, I can do a colon two. So whatever I learn in the list, in terms of slicing, like all the all the things to 
pick out values from the n element to the n plus whatever element, all those operations with square bracket all works. Okay. So let's move on to data frames. So data frame, okay, is said is the most commonly used data structure in pandas. Um, so think of data frame is a n-dimensional array that's of course two dimension. Um, sim so it's just like your spreadsheet, uh, SQL table, or uh, you can say a dictionary or series objects. Okay. To create a data frame, you can supply a 2D numpy array, read from a file, yep, or manually generate one in the code. Okay. Or you can put it from another data frame structure. So to create a data frame by yourself, if you're not reading from a file, then you call this function call or this method called data frame. First parameter will be the data itself, second parameter will be the different indexes, and the final one will be the column labels. Okay. Now I'm gonna do this. So you can try on a slide 27 the code. So you can use numpy to generate some random numbers first. Numbers. Okay, so my data mp dot and then dot and int maybe a hundred numbers. Then my df is this data frame my data. Okay. So if I don't, you just do this, right? Just don't do anything else. Just create a random numbers, whatever the size you like it. Throw in the data frame, and then print my df. What happened? <coughs> ah, the other one. Wait. Okay, so here's my DF. Okay, if you have a lot of values in the data frame, you will print like the first 30 and then the last 10. Okay. So this is the data frame from a raw set of random numbers. It will also tell you if you print DF the number of rows times the number of columns. Bring the type. Okay, so let's get the type. So, mm -hmm. D types. Yeah. So if you were to try to do a uh, print, so we'll print two more values, which is the type of the D, the, var the variable, and as well as the D types in the data frame. So if I do the print, the type of the variable, of course it's called. You will see that it's from pandas is a data frame type. Now, if you try to print the D types, here it gives actually the values of floats. Uh, so the D types are all the value inside your head of floats. And it's an object. Okay. okay. So next, we're going to try to specify columns and indexes. Uh, at this moment, you're just going to play with a lot of random numbers. So unlike the first example where you read the file, everything is formatted nicely for you. You're like making stuff from scratch. So here, if in this data, this random random uh, float numbers, okay, I can say columns. Uh, so column basically refer to the, the values, uh, the labels, okay. Then followed by the index. Now index here is so remember index hit number of indexes has to be relevant or to be seen as the length of the data that I sent in. So if I'm gonna have a hundred items here, my index better be a hundred items. So if not, then I can specify like some of five of them. Okay. Then indexes is totally up to you. You can use text or numbers to represent them. So if you specify the columns, um, if you have one column only then just a number, then you can see that oh this itself big numbers is uh, 
column label for the cell values. Now, index here, we I custom it to letters, so it will, it will appear on the left hand side. The example in PowerPoint shows you how you can have like different columns. So if you have more columns in your data, then you can have another column label in your columns uh, list. Okay, so here are some more examples of the data called the columns. So columns here, the column names are derived, these are automatically taken from the dictionary keys. So if you have constructed account kind of dictionary, the dictionary will be similar to your data that you read. So if I say my dictionary, So let's say this is G and K. Sorry. Maybe I'll do random. So I can use this to create some values. Now, normally you would be reading from a file to get this. So I'm gonna put. So first thing is some values from somewhere, random in random numbers. But I put it into a dictionary, and then I set it up into my data frame. Okay. This time without actually specifying the column name. So if you have a dictionary, then you will conveniently use your keys as the columns. So like here, SG comes up as uh, one of the keys here, FR and MY. Okay. So this structure is pretty similar to um, if you're reading from a CSV file. So every column you see CSV file, CSV file when it goes in data frame, naturally well, the first value there will become your column label. So it's another example here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna add one more thing. Hmm, this is interesting. So when you have a dictionary like this, weights and heights, um, I put in a data frame. I can shift a data frame and then append and modify it further. Okay. So let's say I have this um, numbers under the three three different columns. So now create another data frame. So data frame allows you to supply a list, uh, n-dimensional numpy array or a data data frame. So you can say this is my df and I want to replace it with different indexes. In this case, maybe um, okay. maybe this, some, okay. some random values. Huh? Oops, clean my DM. Oh, wait. I cut my. Hold on.
here need to do another sorry okay so right okay i think i missed one step if i want to pull out the data frame into another data frame i need to uh, extract it out first okay Okay, so next thing here, um, okay, dictionary keys as it as a indexes. So here is another example of a dictionary with the key values had as a series, and the series itself has specified an index. Say I will do this, uh, and I specify the index as I, oops, think so. Okay, so we try doing this, create a series. Now, if I missed out the index here, for this one, let's see what happened. No. So, okay, two indexes in each of the series A and B, it, it she shows up on the left hand side. Uh, if they are different, what happens? Okay. So, something uh, weird just happened, right? Now, if I have two series that have the same indexes and put them into a dictionary and pass them to the frame, so you notice that for the I here, the same position, everything falls in nicely so i here can be one on a column and b column the same i goes for 99 if i will change the iv here to another value okay so all the i matching i's indexes the values will match up so first one i here 99 the two i with 2 and 45 the i3 and 67 the last one here so x will be for 4 okay in column a and iv is for 12 in column b okay but the problem is that a doesn't have iv and b doesn't have x okay, so it's like like holes that missing holes or gaps so the, the gaps here we plug in by pandas replacing with a non numerical value Something like, like something like a now value like that. <clears throat> okay, if let's say I remove one element from here. So two series, one has three elements, the other has four elements, but there are some matching indexes. 
the at the list that has a missing value will be replaced by a, a not a bad not a n a n which is not a number value uh, from pandas. So this is this is the case that if you have two sets of data, but they sort of they are not the same length, and neither are the indexes actually hundred percent matching. And you put them in a dictionary, and you first pass on the data frame. Data frame will attempt to fill up the gaps with its own missing values. So these are the missing values actually. Okay. <clears throat> so another example here. Um, so this is a very nice table. So if we look at the final output, which is the table like closing price, market price, PE with the headers. So if this thing is represented in dictionary at each uh, column. So in dictionary, you have to think of column wise, right? Every key in a dictionary is a column. And it has this, and both of them have the same set of indexes here. Okay. Then it will fall in together and I see as a, like a table. Okay. So here's an example of a different. Um, and another way of creating your data frames. So this is a list with two tuples. Okay. So by default, if you send this list of tuples into data frame, then you will get a structure like this. So both on the indexing, both on the so called the headers, you'll be automatically replaced by the index sign on zero for the number of columns. And for the indexes, same thing, sign from zero the number of rows. So this one is another example of dictionary in a list. Okay, so I'll try that. So here's my list. I'm going to create two different data here. <clears throat> okay. So here I created a list of dictionaries. So D4 has is a list, but each element of this is a dictionary that has A and B as so called uh, so called is column or key value. So when I pass D4 in to data frame. I get this kind of a setup where A is the column and B is the column and the values here. So I'm going to, so I created another similar uh, structure which is a dictionary whereby the A is a list of the values that I and B is a set of similar values. So if I put D4 similar into here, will I get the same result as this? No different? Should be nine nine eight. B is seven five. Yeah. So I'll put D four here. Okay. So when I have two structure that look a little bit different, but the um, okay. So the way to look at this is typically if my A A is a is rep a key represents one column and the values in the column are such going downwards right which row 
So this is how you can look at it and see the data. The other way is that for every row, this is one row, 997. The next row is 8 and 5. So D4 looks at your data. D4 when you write the data in the dictionary, list dictionary, you're looking at it in a row form. And D4 similar, you when you write it, you're looking at a column form. However, this two when you put in a data frame is the same thing. So you highlight this kind of uh, structures. So different structures depending on how you get it out uh, and how you put it in, sometimes it can result in the same uh, kind of output. Okay, um, retrieving information from data frames, here are the different uh, type of uh, functions or, me or methods. Mm -hmm. So shape, which gives you the row and column in your data frame. So index will describe, let me try that. Okay. So I'm going to pull out, oh, I'm going to use the HDB data anyway. Functions will be shape. Okay. Index. So index, when you print out index from data frame like this, um, very useful information. It tells you the index starts from zero, stops at thirty-seven. Step means basically the increment. So increment is actually one. Typically, most indexers should have an index of, uh, increment a step of one. Other functions available to you will be columns, count, info, and D types. So if you want to find out quickly about the data that you just read in, you can call column. Sorry, columns. Yeah. So columns will give you uh, basically I think it is a list. Yeah. The list of different type of columns you have available in data frame. Let me just try and see what happens with this. So the list itself, you can actually iterate, you do a loop or subsetting to pick up the values you want from that mm -hmm. columns. Other stuff, uh, let's see, what's this? Info. So what's the info? Uh, okay. Info is this, uh, this whole range. So info gives you a consolidated view of the type uh, range index, data columns, what is the what are the different columns in there, information, some uh, memory usage. Okay. And finally your D types. I think just now we did try to look at D types. So D types here will be describing each column and the respective the data type. So this function, some of them will be very useful, uh, especially the columns. This will be useful if you read a data frame and you want to iterate through the columns and get some of the data out. Um, info, not very much unless you want to read out generally what the data has. Okay. Right, so I think we can move on to other stuff. Okay. Other functions that you have here, let's see, there's sum, cumulative sum, mean, max. So you all remember your mean and max, uh, sum, mean, median, I think you can use all of this here. So, say I can do sum of, finance, okay. sum of. Is it 
some of it. I think I shouldn't do that. Come on. Okay. okay. Sum. So what does sum give me? Financial year. Oh. So sum basically sums everything. Not exactly very useful. So unless I specify what I want to sum. Okay, let me go back to that one. So I want to sum only the last column, which is my number of applications. So if I want to sum all the applications throughout data, the data is collected. So sum can be applied to the entire data frame. Then we will try to sum everything. Uh, you can also apply it to a specific column. So this is similar to you know, MPI, NumPy. I can also maybe do the next one. So you can try out the other functions and look at the different results. Cumulative sum. Okay, so you all know what is cumulative cumulative sum, right? Okay. So here she gives you a she gives you a list of cumulative sum, a table. Mm, so I wouldn't use it like that. Okay. Other functions min and max. Okay, so let me find out. So here minimum. Oh, so this is least applications. In these applications, be this most applications is this max. So from the HDB data, I want to find out what's the least and most application. I can apply the mean and max as well. Yeah. Okay. Five. Okay. <clears throat> So there's other functions which is this idx min and idx max. So what does idx mean? Idx mean and the idx stand for it stands for is usually called index. So here, right, what happened is I have shown I have found out that oh the least application is five. Mm -hmm. My question is when did that happen, right? Uh, so so I'm going to full so to find out the year, uh, let's see. Okay. IDX min. Okay, so IDX min will give me the index. So what I need to grab from this is the financial year. So I'm gonna pull out use the index mean to give me the year that this number five application came from. Okay, 2016. So in order to give me the year, okay. So first of all, my data my data frame uh um, the oh, HDB. Okay. So my data frame here in the year financial year. So this. DHDB hub, DHDB financial gives me the list of all the years, okay. But the IDX mean tells me the position or the index where the number application is the smallest. So I use that to pull into financial year to give me the year 2016. So I can also apply the same thing for the max to get the same information, okay. But now I instead of using the IDX mean, I'll use IDX uh, max. Okay. 
So knowing the least and the most application just became a bit more useful when no which year that happened. So five application in 2016 and in 2000 in 2009. Okay. So this is how you can use the IDX mean and max. Okay, so this uh will give you literally like a histogram breakdown uh, or a distribution breakdown of your values. Okay, so if I want to call out, and, um, in this case, it's going to give me a lot of, a lot of values there, so I'm not going to actually print it into a format string. So here, you can full describe. So when you pull describe, you should describe it based on one column that have a set of um, number values. Oops, weapon. Oh, wait. Oh, number of applications. Okay. okay. So if you do describe for, in this case, the HDB data I have, which is applications to finance or repurchase finance, you get this set of numbers here. Um, so it gives you something like a distribution statistics, which is your counts, mean, standard, uh, your standard deviation, minimum, and your percentiles. Okay. So if you're working with standard requirement of getting some of these distribution numbers, you can use this function. And of course, mean and median. So if you, you can pull out the mean, uh, I think I did that before. And I may just... This. Okay. I think some of you in CA1 did like, uh, for your every data set, you did something like uh, textual <coughs> analysis, right? Minimum, maximum, sum, mean, medium. Okay, then you went on to do a plot. So this part of the functions in pandas also allows you to do the same thing. Okay. And yep, subsetting. So subsetting is not much different from your regular pandas um, <coughs> or list, except for this thing called location and i location. Okay, so lock and i lock. These two things uh, will be kind of different when you're trying to do subsetting a bit. So by color name, I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay. So now I'm gonna try. So let me reuse this data up here. Okay. So yeah. Patients. Oops. So this is the regular way of pulling out two columns. So I'm going to use one of the examples here, which is the lock, right? So I use the hub patient. The Um, please take note in the example in PowerPoint. So location is like calling out for your okay. The square bracket subsetting right first first part of parameter expect is the number of rows you want. So you put a colon means you're gonna get everything. If you put one or two or single, you can expect only one row. So you gonna put if I want to put everything, then I put use a colon. Then the second portion is the columns that I want to extract. 
So let's say I want to do just financial year, all of them. Okay, hide stuff first. Oh, HDB. Okay, so this will give me all the rows here. If I want to only extract the first 0 to 10. Yeah. Okay, do you notice something about the um, colon uh, here? So you know that in basic Python, when you subset the list, you specify, let's say the list length is 100, you specify colon 10, you will get 0 to 9 because the last number is ignored, right? Now here when you use pandas and use lock, your, the last number is not ignored, it's taken into account. Sorry. So when you are losing pandas, when you start, you should consider that the number you specify here includes that row also. Okay. So ten here will not retrieve ten rows zero to nine. In fact, it is zero to ten includes of this value. So when I'm retrieving multiple, uh, let's say another column, yeah, you can do this too. So this is achieved uh, with the log. So log is like a way of assessing the array uh, or a list in Python. Now the same, you can also apply the same um, colon, like retrieve from first to the x colon, uh, column by doing this. Sorry. Oh, that's I log, sorry. Okay, there's another way of retrieving the columns uh, based on the range, or so called here. Yeah. So if I want to do, okay, the data don't have a lot, this doesn't have a lot of columns here. So maybe I do the financial year to the last okay, so I put financial year here, followed by the colon. Okay. So when I use a colon in for the second portion of the subsetting, so this will give me the first column, the colon would tell pandas to retrieve anything in between this column to the next column. Uh, and the order will depend on your CSV file, the order of the columns. So unless you know the position of columns, then you, might, then you can use this to say, I want this section of the columns. From there. Okay. The other rest of the examples here, so next example actually is by index. We using so notice that the function is using is called or the property is called i log. Okay. So if I'm gonna print the HTTP data using i log. Okay, so first example, when I want to retrieve the column, I'm using uh, specifying the column names. But the next one, if I do not want to specify column names, but just the index of the column, then I'll use the uh, iLog. Zero here will give me the financial year. If I put to one, then it will give me the application types. If I have a uh, zero to one, it will give me the first two columns. Okay. So if I want, let's say, the first two columns, after the comma here, I should draw a list and the index, the index value of the columns I want here. 
So zero will be for financial year, one will be for the application time. What happens if I put a minus one? C. Okay, so minus one actually is count coming from the end of the column. Right. Final example will be the subset. So this yeah. So the other way of calling out the columns is by the range. Um, this way, we don't use a square bracket around it. We just straight away define the start number to the the start to the end. But the end here does not include the doesn't ex include this value. So if I were to put zero to one, you only retrieve zero. The column index zero. If I put zero to two, you retrieve column index zero and one. Okay. So if you so. The rule of thumb is if you want to retrieve the columns in your data frame by the column label, you should use lock. If you want to retrieve by the column index, then you should use I lock. So if you remember your Boolean indexing, you can also apply the same thing uh, in here. So this is an example of a Boolean index where it's searching for population or pop. It's more than a million, more than ten million. Okay, then it actually assigns out as a data frame, so it can do some simple searches in your in the example here. Okay, so let's say in my this HDB data, I want to find out all the applications. I want to filter out the applications that the fill out the years that have more than uh, let's see, more than five thousand applications. Okay, so so I will use lock. Um, so if you use lock first of all, you want all the rows, right? So you should um, first should have the colon. This will retrieve all the available rows. Second would be the column you want to filter by, and then followed by the criteria. Okay, so when you do this, right, what you get is a Boolean index, true or false. So in order to uh, in order to get the final data, you have to apply your Boolean index onto your actual onto your original data. Then you will get your final data frame, which will give you the result based on your, your criteria. So if you remember how you construct Boolean indexes uh, in your assignment, you can apply the same thing using log and then apply it, remember apply it to your final your, your data, then you get a new data frame here. So this data frame you can actually assign it to a new variable and then from there you can process it data based on your your uh, criteria. Okay. Has anyone heard of this thing called regular expressions? No. You've already heard of it before. Okay. <clears throat> uh, regular expression is a completely different topic. So we also call regular expressions as rejects. R-E-G, uh, E-X, or in some places R-E-G, X, E-X, R, okay. Uh, to learn regular expression is a separate topic on its own, but you can use some very basic commands to look for things. So in the slides here, I think there's some uh, basic stuff that you can use. Okay. So regular expression is a syntax that allows you to do text matching, or text re and, and then subsequently text replacement. So for example, if you have a large text file with a lot of values, and it's just very difficult, you want to find out the number of times certain things occur in the text, like a certain word or phrase, you can use regular expressions to do that kind of checking. Or you want an example, you want to extract 
only numbers from this block of text. You can use regular expression to do it. So in the slide, I think the lecturer has provided some basic examples uh, like this. So the slash and dot uh, attempts to match text that contain a period. Uh, the dot is a period. Okay. P and the dollar sign matches text at the end of the P. The carrot symbol, so the carrot symbol is the one in the keyword that's like a up symbol, uh, arrow up, uh, matches text starting with C. So here's some basic text matching to find text beginning, ending, containing something, um, and so on. So, so, you, so it has a certain set of, uh, there's a way of creating a combination of these rules to give you exactly what you want. Okay, but don't worry too much about it because uh, you can learn this on your own. You can pick back some of these basic things. Now, if you want to learn about regular expressions, um, I will recommend this site here called regexr.com. So they will actually teach you, this site teaches you the different basic expression and they give you an example. Like this case, if my first expression is this, like A to Z, what does it mean? So in they give you a text to find out like or where the highlighted ones matches what is looking for. Okay. So if you want to find some way of learning this quickly, you can go to this site uh, and then try out their super patterns. We call this patterns uh, this thing. Uh, okay. So um there's a note, this regular expression is not the core inside the module, it's an uh, extra, okay, but it's useful in some situations. So on to more uh, subsetting rows. Okay, so here you notice more of the lock and I lock um, methods uh, being used in some of the other uh, some of the other functions. So you've seen head and tail. There's also sample, um, which is randomly select fraction rows. Okay, n largest and n smallest select the top n entries okay so these are based on what is the largest in that column okay okay so going next to this okay subsetting by rows what am i looking at <clears throat> So when you when we encounter the lock function or the lock uh, method just now, okay. So lock gives you it lets you let lets you do subsetting. Um, in this case, the earlier examples have always been give me all the rows. Then I want this column, that column by the label, or I can even do indexing. So on top of that, um, now this is assuming that your indexes uh in a running order from 0 to the last number, last row. So what if the indexes are actually something like in this example, student IDs. So this table here is unique because in from your file that you obtain, it does it has actually unique student IDs. So example like a student database in the worksheet or Excel spreadsheet, most of the time your left column will always be something like a unique identifier, email, IC number, student ID, and then followed by the columns which describe this unique individual's information. So in this case, when you read such a data, um, you will probably not use an index that starts from zero. You might prefer to use the index that you, that is existing in the table, like the student ID itself. Okay. So if you are doing that, how do you access the data um, with using log? So here, if you do log followed by this the number here, it will basically reference the row where the index belong, the index has this value. Okay. Now in order to tell pandas that you want one of the columns in your data file to be an index column, when you read the CSV, we call the index column parameter and specify the column to be used as index. So when you do this, you have to ensure, first of all, the index column has only unique values. Sorry? The index column. So when you extract the data and you call the read CSV, you want to tell pandas which column is the index column. The column data the data has to have unique values only. So like email, IC numbers, so it doesn't have values that repeat. Okay. 
So if you're assessing by the labels, basically you you treat you can actually treat the values here as labels itself, either referring to one or a selection uh, set of uh, values. Subsetting rules by index, uh, same thing applies. Actually, indexing is this will be similar. This will be actually yeah. Just re, re just this will be actually retrieving by the rows. So if I'm going to let's say retrieve from the HV data first ten rows or first twenty first twenty rows, then I just do I lock colon 20 now if you do i lock colon 20 compared to lock, lock 20 what happens is that this time round this last number they specify is not included in the row or not taken not retrieved uh, as part of the result so compared to if i do this lock 20 then i get the last i get number 20th called index in also Okay, here's an example. So this one is using a is in. Oh, okay. So this example of subsetting sub rows by Boolean logic. So firstly, I'm choosing like the student cost based on the criteria. Student cost equal D bit, and then apply this to the data frame. So there's another function here. It's an is in function. Okay, so if you do the first method, if you use the first method, you will be restricted to like only one condition. Uh, if you want to have multiple condition, you can use the is in uh, method to filter. Okay. So okay, I'm going to use the application type here. So let's say I want to find out all the applications that is either new flat buyers or resale flat buyers. I will use call data frame by the column and wait no machine by the property name directly. Okay, so this is new. Huh? So instead of using the square bracket, pass in the application type uh, as a string. So it's in it's a list. So I'm gonna pull out new flat buyers. And we sell flat buyers. Okay. So this itself is so this particular statement here is a bullet indexing. So I'll need to apply this bullet index to my data. Print this out. I miss something? Yes. Oh, bias, right? Yeah. Okay. So this will give me a Boolean index for like multiple string matches. So if I want to have choose multiple string type categories that I can use this is in to create a Boolean index. And also, you so going back to regular expressions, uh, you can also use that to find things. So you all recall that you all have a your C A one some of the data come in quarters, right? Two thousand seven zero Q one, two thousand seven Q two Q three. So this is one way to use regular expression to extract maybe all the Q ones or all the Q twos only. Okay. So you get a brain next, you can apply, then you get your final data, only the quarter ones and only the quarter fours. Okay. <clears throat> Do you all need a break now? <laughs> 